the question I want to ask, this is the big elephant in the church question, is how do you, how do you show the love of Jesus to those who aren't like you? How do you show the love of Jesus uh, to those who aren't like you? And another way of asking this big elephant in the church question is, what do you smell like? What do you smell like? Now, when I was, uh, uh, after I graduated from high school in 1983, my parents um, moved to South Florida and I moved with them to start a church. And it was the first church my dad had started. And before we moved, I sold uh, this car that I had through, through high school. It was kind of a beater. And I sold it, and my idea was that I was, you know, the money that I had already saved and, and making some more money in, in Florida, I would buy a new car. And so we got to Florida, and I got a pa- newspaper out and looked in the classified ads. That's back when we used, that's how we used to do it back in the day, get a paper. And, and I started looking for cars, and, and I was working full-time at Radio Shack and going to school uh, my first semester of college. And uh, so I started circling all these cars that I thought were really interesting. And my dad and I started going and looking at all these cars. And we got to this one car and <clears throat> we got in and we drove it around. And I said, Dad, I think I like this car. And he's like, seriously, son, I mean, th- this is the car? Like, you've saved enough money to buy a really cool car, like a Camaro or a back in the day El Camino or, you know, you could get a Cutlass. I mean, you know, that, I don't know what that is. But that, that was cool back in the day. And so I don't have a picture of that car, but I did pull up one that was very similar, same color, same style, same rooftop, the whole thing. And, and so this is the car that I bought. <clears throat> and and, and I, my dad, I mean, he's just scratching his head because he really liked cars. He's like, seriously, son, you realize this is a family sedan. My car had four doors, by the way, okay? This is, this is cool. I mean, dad, this car's got leather seats. And he says, son, this is vinyl. This is not leather. But look, look at the roof. Look at how the, it's got this leather roof top because that's vinyl too, son, and it's rusting from the top down. Like, it's this car, I'm like, but this is the one. He's like, what, where did I fail you, son? Where, where, what's going? So, so, so I bought that car. Let me, same color, that one right there. And uh, I was a family man at 18. I don't know what was going on in my life, but, but I drove that car all over the place. I drove it from Florida to Texas, from Texas to Michigan and back, from, from, from Texas to Virginia, from Virginia to Mid- I mean, I drove that car for a few years everywhere, and it finally had enough, and it started overheating. And, and you know how most cars, when they overheat, they, they, the smoke starts coming out from underneath the, the hood? This car, when it overheated, smoke came through the vents, and so I remember my junior year, I had transferred to Liberty University in Virginia. I remember having to drive from my apartment to school. And as I'm driving down Highway 460, I, I had to roll my window down and stick my head out just so I could see going down the highway. Like, that's not safe. Well, I was, what, 20 years old at the time. So we do stupid things sometimes. But so, and there are times I had to pull over just to let the car air. I mean, smoke, you know. And, and, and what was crazy is... The smell of burnt antifreeze just permeated my skin, my clothes. I mean, I would park and go into school, and everywhere I went, people would look at me like, dude, you smell. I mean, what, what's going on here? And things I touched, places I sat, rooms I walked into. I just spread the, the nasty uh, aroma of antifreeze everywhere I went, and quite honestly, it was embarrassing. And then finally, I, I realized I think it's time for a new car. Here's the truth about the matter, right? We all smell like something. You, we all have a smell about us. Now, I, I sit in, I've been, ever since we opened this building in 2005, I've been sitting right here over in this area. And, and I've got to say this, there's some good smelling people that sit right over here in this area. I like sitting over here. Uh, I, I don't know what y'all wear over there, but it's night. You, y'all smell good. Now, I've never sat over here. I don't know what y'all smell like over here. Uh, I've heard rumors, but I think y'all smell good. Maybe not. I don't know. But, you know, we... Amy and I just, uh, we just got back uh, from leading a pastor's vision tour uh, to Scotland. We just got back this a couple days ago and had a chance to take uh, a lot of pastors and their spouses from about eight different churches. And, uh, and there was a family from, from Chicago that jumped in. I don't know how that dog got there. But anyways, um, but we had a phenomenal time. And we, at the very end of our trip, we, had to, we were on a different flight than everyone else. We had to fly from Edinburgh back to Paris and then Paris back to Atlanta. And on our plane going to France, we had, I would say, I won't tell you what age they group they were, but we had about 30 younger, like, like t- we had some teenagers who kind of just forgot, I don't know, somewhere that deodorant really is a good thing. Like it's a good thing. 
And so it was a tough plane ride to, from, from Edinburgh to Paris, especially for the, the, this whole group was sitting way in the back. We had a little bit, we were a little bit more in the front. And, uh, but but it, it, it was strong. But, but here's the thing. We all smell like something, don't we? We all have kind of a fragrance about us. When we walk into a room, our, our fragrance permeates the room. Now, let me ask you a question. When you're around someone who just stinks badly, what, what do you want to do? Well, you're thinking, I got to get away from this person. Like, I, I've got to... I've got to figure out how to exit this. When you're around someone who, who has this alluring, captivative, you know, stank, you know, I got to get away. But if you have somebody who just, I mean, they just smell nice. There's just something like, ah, you don't know what it is, but they just have a, just a, a, a nice smell about them. You, you just want to kind of get a little closer. Like, what's that fragrance? Like, let me lean into that fragrance. Man, they got some nice, nice, nice mouthwash. Don't get that close because that's weird. But you, you, you just, I, I've had moments, Amy and I both were like, hey, what's that perfume? Or, you know, hey, what's that? I'll, hey, dude, what, what cologne are you wearing? Because it's just a good smell to it, right? I don't know if you know this, sir, but, but casinos and hotels, they actually pump in just this alluring smell through the vents into the places where you gamble so that you'll just want to stay there and spend money. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but the Bible actually tells us that there should be this alluring, sweet smell that just comes from our lives. There, there should be a beautiful aroma that just flows out of our lives. There should be this irresistible fragrance that comes from our lives that just permeates whatever environment that we're in, whatever group that we're around, whoever we're talking to. Here's how the Apostle Paul, who actually wrote uh, uh, the books of 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, here's what he says about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. He says, now, now he, being God, uses us, to spread the knowledge of Christ everywhere, like a sweet perfume. Our lives are a Christ-like fragrance rising up to God. Now, the Apostle Paul, who's the writer, he says that, that, he says that God wants to use you to spread the good news of Jesus Christ everywhere we go. Whatever environment that we're in, regardless of whatever room we're in, whatever people group that we're in, uh, whatever people may look like, we, he wants us to share Christ with them like a sweet perfume. What does that mean? What does that mean? Well, the message that God so loved the whole world that he gave his only son, Jesus, that whoever, whoever, would believe that Jesus is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. God says they would not die and go to hell, but would spend eternity with God in heaven. That is the message. That, that's the, it's, that message, the Bible says, is like a sweet perfume. And for every person that has believed that Jesus is the Son of God and who has received his free gift of salvation and forgiveness of sin, those who have placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone for salvation, because now you are a beloved son or a daughter of God, that sweet-smelling message should be what we want to share with other people. But also, here's the deal. The way we live our lives should now be characterized by an alluring, irresistible, Christ-like fragrance. You say, what does that smell like? What, what, what does it smell like? Here's how the Bible describes it. Real simple. Love. That, that's the sweet-smelling fragrance of Christ. Here's the, we were created to bring glory to God by receiving his love. Now think about this for a moment. The God of the universe, the one who, who created everything into existence and now holds it all together, who, who basically created you, this God who doesn't need a thing, he has no need of anything, he created us because he has something to give. What is that? He has, he has love to give. And God wants you this morning to receive his love. He wants, you, he wants us to soak ourselves in his love. He wants to rest in it. And he, re, he wants us to rest in it. And he wants it to just let it fill our lives. But then he wants us to go out and share this sweet smelling message with the rest of the world. And, and even more than that, he wants our lives to be so immersed in this love that it just permeates everything like a sweet smelling fragrance. It it doesn't just fill us, but it just flows out of us, overflows onto everything that we touch and everybody that we're around. Second Corinthians, we move into chapter five. Paul says in verse 14, he says, Christ's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all, all died to our old life. He died for everyone, everyone, 
so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. Paul, so Paul says, out of love for all, Christ died for all. Out of love for all, Christ died for all. And once we believe that Christ died for us and we receive his gift of love and forgiveness and we also, what we do, we receive, the Bible says, new life. And that new life that we have been given replaces the old life. Literally the nasty smell of sin and death, the old life before Christ has now been replaced with the beautiful smell of love and new life. And now the Apostle Paul says Christ's love actually controls us. It, it, it has permeated our lives and now every environment, every person, every room should smell the love of Jesus coming out of our lives when we walk into the room. Paul says a few verses later that this love should now make us look different to the rest of the world. We should actually begin to see people through the eyes of Jesus. Our job now is to be ambassadors of his love to the rest of the world. Now, don't misunderstand something here, okay? We need to tell everybody we know about Jesus and how he has rescued us from our sin and from death. But our lives should be an alluring fragrance that God can use to draw people to his son, Jesus. Now. There's a huge problem that I see, okay? And this burdens me deeply. Not everyone who calls themselves a follower of Jesus today smells like Jesus. Not everybody who's calling themselves, not everybody out there, maybe in the room, who, who has said, oh yeah, I'm a follower of Jesus, smells like Jesus. Not everyone who claims to belong to Jesus acts like Jesus or loves like Jesus. The fragrance that they're throwing off it is not a sweet perfume. It's, it's not an irresistible fragrance. It's not attractive to those who need to hear the good news, the gospel, the message of Jesus that, who, who gave his life for everyone. See, because people, people who hear the beautiful words of God, of the, of the gospel, and how, how Jesus loves them and, and gave his life for them, but then watch some people live lives who claim to be his followers, they are actually turned off by that smell. That, that nasty stench actually drowns out the beautiful, alluring power of the words. And I see this stink everywhere. I see it on social media. I'll, I, I have to take a break from social media in the summer. It just wears me out. But I see it on social media. I see it in the news. People who claim to be followers of Jesus spewing hatred and judgment towards people who, who believe differently than, than, than they do, who vote differently than they do. You, you can just smell the nasty aroma coming off the computer. There's, a, there's like a foul smell that, that comes from those who, who look down their noses at, at other people who may not embrace the same theological system as they do. It's a, it's a big thing. For centuries and even now, people who, 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 who claim to have the love of Jesus in their heart look differently at people who have different skin color or different cultural backgrounds. With, we looked, at, looked at those folks with deep bitterness and hatred and they, they cover it up with the nice Sunday morning go to church clothes. But under all, it's, it's a rotten, rancid stink that just just comes from their lives. People who claim to be filled with the aroma of the love of Jesus, but as soon as they get around, some folks of a different social economic background that maybe is not the same as theirs, all of a sudden it's like this negativity and judgment just begins to pour out of their mouth like a bad, stinky breath. And here's my question for all of you today, and I ask this with as much love in my heart as I have for you, and I love you. What does your life smell like? What, what aroma is your life giving off? What, what's your fragrance? Are you giving off the, the sweet smelling fragrance of the love of Jesus or are your words and your actions stinking up the place with the smell of the old life that, that you came out of when Jesus saved you? Now, now I wanna share some burdens that I have with you and this is where we're gonna get a little dicey. There are at least seven different generations that are alive in our world today. Six of them are probably represented in this room at some point. Um, the, the Bible talks about, not the Bible, the, the, um, I got this from the latest U.S. Census Bureau. But uh, you have the, the, the greatest generation, 
All right, anyone from 91 to 103. If we have anybody over 91 in here, you are my hero. I'm so glad that you have chosen to come to Westridge Church, all right? And I know you may have grabbed some earplugs in the back, but we're glad you're here, okay? But then you got the silent generation, 73 to 90. You got the baby boomers, and some, a lot of you in here, baby boomers. My generation, all right, I'm the, 1965, uh, the oldest of that, the generation Xers. And then you got the millennials, all right? And if you notice, uh, the Gen Ys, millennials, it's the largest population in the United States right now, 79.4 million. And then the Gen Zs, who are 3 to 18 years old. And you can look at different websites, and some of these years are a little bit different, but that's a pretty big group of folks there. And then you got some, uh, all the newbies. Uh, we had a little baby over here who's a moment ago. Uh, you got some, those are the Gen Alphas, or whatever we're going to call it next. Just recently, a new, brand new Pew Research report came out that 40% of millennials, okay, which is, our, again, the largest of these population bases, have absolutely no religious affiliation. Matter of fact, they, they, we call them the nuns, not the N-U-N-S, but the N-O-N-E-S, nuns. That means there's, they, they have no religious affiliation. They, re, they, they identify with no one. And that number is compounding with each generation. This, this generation, 37 and below, they are walking away from the church and Christianity in record numbers, all right? It's this group right up here, this, this, this group right up here. And, and I know some of you, I mean, and what, what's interesting is that generations look down on the generations below them. We always judge the, the generation below us. And my, my generation, the Gen Xers, we've been pretty rough on these millennials here. But these, these, these folks are walking away from the church and Christianity in droves, all right? And we're like, you know, I, I see them out there with the skinny jeans and they got the man bun. Can I, can I show you something about the man? The man bun is actually the mullet of the millennials, okay? Now, some of you in here, you rock the mullet. Be honest, how many of you rock the mullet? All right? We got some Billy Ray Cyruses in here. All right, you rock the mullet. But here's the truth. Many, many of them are rejecting that the Bible is true and they're leaving for that reason. But latest research says that 60% say that Christians, the reason they're leaving is Christians are too judgmental. 64% that say that the church is just anti-everything. In other words, the smell that's coming from Christians is a fragrance of judgment and negativity and a group that is against everything. And it's very different than the fragrance of Christ. And I am burdened deeply for these three generations. And you should be too, because they're our kids. And I take responsibility just as much as anyone. But we've got to pour into these generations. They have got to see something different inside of us, all right? I mentioned that I just got back from Scotland. Scotland is, I mean, it's so beautiful. We took this picture. We, we drove up to, to Loch Ness. And uh, listen, I rented a car, wrong side of the road, sitting on the wrong side of the car, shifting with my left hand. Every, everybody survived. Uh, and, and it was crazy. But I mean, what a beautiful country. But Scotland is a post-Christian nation for the older generation of Scots. But I would call it a pre-Christian nation for the younger generations. And we just planted a church there, Cross Point uh, Community Church in Livingston, which is about 30 minutes outside of, of Edinburgh. And I got a chance to preach there last Sunday. Guess who the new believers are in the church? Younger people, teenagers, pre-Christians, these millennials and below, actually it's the younger than that, who are, have come to the end of themselves and are now going, there's gotta be more. There's got, we, this, this nation for hundreds of years has tried everything else. There's got to be more. And they're open to talking about Jesus and they're coming to Christ and they're willing to come to church. And can I tell you, this is where our nation is heading. And Scotland, listen, it's a nation that gave us the Presby Presbyterian denomination. This country back in the 1700s was sending, out, that was sending out missionaries to all over the world. The impact that Scotland has had on America, we don't even know how deep it is. I've been on three spiritual history tours when I've been there. It's amazing, but in the mid-1700s, Scotland began to turn away from Jesus. And over the years, they, they began to replace Christianity and Jesus with philosophy and science and humanism and atheism. And now they've come to the end of themselves. And here we are today, less than 1% of the population of Scotland actually identify themselves as Christ followers, believers in Jesus. Last year, Scotland was listed as an unreached people group. And this is where we're heading. If we don't reach these younger generations with the gospel, we, we will be there quickly. And that means for those of us that are 
that are in our upper 30s and older, we're going to have to change our scent because our current fragrance is driving the younger generation away from the church and away from Jesus. You see, how do we change our scent so we smell like Jesus? Here's the thing. We have got to spend more time in his presence. See, because when you spend, when you spend some time with someone, you begin, you know, you're just around them a lot. You begin to talk like them. You begin to act like them. You begin to think like them. You actually begin to smell like them, right? And we have to begin to live and act and think and smell like people that are from a citizens of a different kingdom. And if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, listen, you are a beloved son and daughter of God the Father. You belong to a different kingdom than the one you're currently living in. And that means you serve a different king and his name is Jesus. Therefore, our thoughts and our actions and how we believe and how we view the, the world, how we view politics, how we view the pe people around us, the people that are different, should reflect the mindset of our king who loves all and gave his one and only son's life for all. And our prayer, our prayer should be, Father, may your kingdom come here in Northwest Atlanta as it is in heaven. In other words, we're asking the rule and reign of Jesus be reflected in the community, especially in the lives of those who call themselves children of the king. Lord, may your kingdom come. I've been praying around this building now for the last almost two years now, and that's been my prayer. Lord, may your kingdom come on Westridge Church as it, in, as it is in heaven. May we see the world through the eyes of the king. It should change the way that we are relating to this world. It should cause our burden for the world to look different than, than every other, every political party. If you line up 100% with one of them, you're missing something. It should make us look different than every religious system that does not reflect the words and the commands of our King Jesus and his kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. Now, let me share another burden I have with you. Over the years, Christians have had no problem having a burden for people from different countries, people even from most religions. We, uh, here at Westridge, we, we work in a few different countries very strategically, long term. We have a burden for people from Guatemala and Nicaragua and Cuba and Spain and, and Scotland. We've been sending missionaries, we have missionaries all over on almost every continent. And, I, and I'm going to say this, it took Christians way too long to get a burden for Africa because in the, in the 80s and 90s, we just bought into this false mindset that God was throwing down the hammer of judgment on the continent of Africa with an AIDS epidemic. Oh my goodness. And finally, in the last 15 years or so, the church has gotten their act together and we're doing, Westridge, we're doing everything we can to spread the sweet smelling fragrance of Jesus to this little country that God has led us to in, called Burkina Faso, this little landlocked country in Northwest Africa. And we are, we are putting freshwater wells there. We are planting churches there. We have adopted an unreached people group. We are, we are sponsoring children through Compassion International. We're, we're building schools and trade centers. And we built a house to rescue young ladies out from the sex trafficking uh, system in Burkina. I mean, we're doing, we are, we are looking, what are the needs of this country? And we're going after those things. And we have a burden for Jewish people and we have a burden for Hindus and Buddhists and we work with animists in Africa, but, 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 but. What about these people right here? Okay. What about the Muslims? See, Muslims make up nearly 25% of the world's population. Matter of fact, by 2050, they will make up 31% of the world's population because Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world. But I have this value that has shaped my life and the decisions that I make and what I do. It's been a value in my life for, for many, many years as a follower of Jesus Christ, and here it is. Everyone deserves an opportunity to hear and respond to the love of Jesus, to the gospel. In other words, God loves Muslims as much as he loves you, and they deserve the same chance that you and I have had to hear how much God loves them and how, 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 how he gave his son Jesus to save them from their sin. Now, some of you are thinking, Brian, do you realize, I don't know if you've been watching the news, Brian, I know you've been away for the summer, but do you realize that some of these people will kill you for trying to convert them to Jesus? Do you know that they actually kill Christians in, in their countries? Mm -hmm. I know all that. Listen, back in 2004, first time I ever went to a Muslim country was in Egypt. And I remember standing on the 10th floor of a hotel in Cairo, I freaked out five times a day, the call to Allah, you know, from the mosques. And I just stood there and I said, Lord, 
you are going to have to break my heart because this is freaking me out and I'm, I'm scared. And you're, you're going to have, you, Lord, and so my prayer was break my heart for what is breaking your heart. And God's done that. And I want to tell you something. Listen to me now. God's up to something. Because over the past many years, God has been revealing himself to Muslims in miracles and visions and dreams. And they are coming to Jesus by the thousands all over the world. You don't hear that on the news. But they're coming to places, in in places like even Iran, where there's an underground church movement happening, where people are coming to Christ in thousands. Now, this is going to rock some of you a bit. Okay? But I've asked many pastors who work with Muslims, and I I know several of them, I've asked them the same question because I've been curious, and they all give me the same response. And here's, here's what I ask them. Do you think it could be that God's bringing some of these folks to us because we won't go to them? Since we can't go safely to some of these Arabic speaking countries with, with the gospel message, could it be that God's bringing them to us? And every one of them said that's exactly what's happening. Listen, currently, there are over one million Arab speaking people in my hometown of Detroit, where I, where, I, where I grew up till I was 15. And I want you to know they are openly, they're asking the question, they're talking. They, they, want, they want to talk about, they want to, they, they want to know about the gospel. Matter of fact, they've said to some of our church planters, we thought we'd hear all about Jesus when we came here, but nobody's telling us about him because everybody's scared of us. And they're coming to Jesus because people are stepping out of their comfort zone to share the love of Jesus with them. They are attracted to the fragrance of Jesus as we share his love with them and serve them. Last month, or excuse me, in June, last month, I had a chance to go with a group of our young adults to work in a little community in Detroit uh, where we are working with a church planter there. And he's planted six house churches now, two in in Windsor in Canada, four in in, in Detroit. It's the same little community where in the 1800s, my relatives, great-great-grandparents came over from Poland and came over from, from Germany, same community. And I got a chance with these young adults to sit in a circle and we spoke, I, me and a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a Muslim imam from that mosque, he's the pastor of that mosque, we sat for three hours and talked about Christianity and the Muslim religion, Islam. We just sat there and talked for three hours while everyone listened. And he took questions and it wasn't hostile. Nobody was trying to take me out. It was just a very civil back and forth conversation. And he kept asking me questions. And I kept praying, Lord, help me to remember verses that I learned when I was a child. And finally, the guy to my left, who was like his head guy, he goes, how about, Pastor, if we just talk in red letters? Let's just talk the words of Jesus. And I'm like, I'm there. And so I'm praying two or three different times. God just teed me up, teed it up for me to share the gospel message from beginning to end. And it was all said and done, three hours later, that group of young adults went out behind that mosque and for about two hours pulled all of the weeds out of their community garden. And all these these Muslims in in full guard walking past and just going, what's going on out there? And that imam, let me take that picture down, that imam walked up to me afterwards and he said, Pastor, I know that you're from here. I wanna talk with you some more. So when you're in town, I want you to call me and let's go out and share some more time together. And this group right here, you're welcome in our area anytime because we, want to, we just want to talk some more about what we were talking about in there. We have to change our mind about what God is doing, what God's doing to bring these people to us. All right, let me shake it up a little bit. Here's another burden I have. This group right here. Now, some of you are thinking, okay, now you're getting under my nerves. Now I'm putting my earplugs in, okay? Listen, some of you are going, Brian, don't, don't you know? I mean, you obviously know the Bible, right? You, you know, you know that the Bible says that being gay is a sin. I, I do. But I also know the Bible says that pornography is sin and lust is sin and gossip is sin and anger and lying and getting drunk and being addicted to something and so is hatred. They're all sins, okay? So here's the question. What fragrance is the gay community getting from the Christian church in America right now? For the most part, rejection and hatred. And I have relatives who are gay, who are openly gay, some who are not quite yet, but I I am deeply burdened for them. I spoke to a couple down here after the first service. Tears 
kids raised in church, both their sons have just come out openly gay. And here's what I, here's what I asked myself all the time, even when they were standing there. Would their sons feel the love of Jesus at Westridge Church? Would my relatives feel the love of Jesus in this church? Would they have the chance to hear the truth about Jesus and how much he loves them and how he has a wonderful plan for their life and how this is a safe place for where sinners can work through their issues and their sins? Or would they walk out feeling shamed and hated and condemned? See, here's a, here's a growing issue that every one of us in this room is gonna have to deal with if we aren't already. We have children in our schools, middle schools, who are openly gay. You have, you have coworkers at work. I talked to another guy who just had deep hatred, but he started working with this guy and they've been talking. We have people in our church who, who are struggling, being bisexual and homosexual, and you're around people who are even transgender and it's becoming more open than any time in history in America. And here's a question that you're gonna have to ask yourself. How will you smell to those people? Now, wait a minute. Wait, wait a minute, Brian. Hold, hold on now. Hold on. See, I'm answering questions you're asking me, but you're... What, what, what about truth? What about the truth of God's word? I'm all about truth, but I'm also all about grace. See, see in, in, the Bible says in John chapter 1, verse 14, verse 14, it says that Jesus came full of grace and grace truth. That means that he was 100% grace, but he was 100% truth. And here's the two parts of the gospel message that we have to embrace. And it's for all of us, by the way. You and I are far, far worse than we can imagine. That's God's truth. But you and I are far more loved than we dared to hope. That's God's grace. You and I are far, far more worse than we can imagine. And we are far more loved than we ever dared to hope. And most people who live a homosexual lifestyle, they know what the church believes about truth, okay? You know what? They know. But I don't know if they really know what we believe about grace. They, they don't know that they're far more loved than they could ever dare to hope. And how will they know how much Christ loves them unless we show them Jesus? What kind of fragrance, Westridge, what kind of fragrance are you giving off towards those who are living in this lifestyle? What do you smell like in your school? What, do you, what, what aroma are you giving out in your workplace? Now, here's another burden. And, I, and I, I, this burdened my heart since the day we moved here. One out of four people in America have become atheists or agnostics. And what kind of fragrance is coming from you when you are around these people? 87% of our community around this building is not on church in any given Sunday. I don't know what that means about them, I'm, but I, most are lost. What, what do they smell when they drive past our church? Here's the truth. On an active, throughout the year, there are 13.5 thousand people that call Westridge Church their home church. Now, that's a lot of folks. They don't know. Y'all don't come on the same Sunday, by the way. But what aroma? What aroma is this lost crowd that lives all around us in the thousands what are they getting from the people of Westridge Church? When they, when they sit with us in the bleachers of football games or around us at restaurants or when waitresses come up and, and wait on your table or you're at a basketball game or a dance recital or a band concert and people know you go to Westridge, is it, is it, a, is it a sweet, beautiful, alluring, irresistible smell of God's love and grace and truth or it is, the, it, it is, is it the nasty stench of hatred and judgment and condemnation and shame? Is it, is it, the, is it the rancid stink of racism that has permeated the South for years, in our whole country for years? Or it is, a, is it the captivating aroma of Jesus, of love and acceptance? Second Corinthians 2, Paul keeps talking about this fragrance in verse 15. He says, but this fragrance, he said, is perceived differently by those who are being saved and by those who are perishing. That's interesting, isn't it? To those who are perishing, we're a dreadful smell of death and doom. Let me tell you what that means. It means that there's gonna be some people that are gonna smell the fragrance of the gospel in your life and they may hear the sweet message of Jesus and how he gave his life for their sins and they're going to reject it. Just know that. It, it, they're going to say no. And some of you have already encountered that. Matter of fact, some of them, they're going to not only oppose it, but they're gonna come against it. And we're seeing that happen, right? However, verse 16 says, but to those who are being saved, we are a life-giving perfume. I love that. For those who are being saved, rescued by Jesus, 
We are a life-giving perfume. There are millions and millions and millions who would receive the gospel message like a life-giving perfume if we would just share it with them. If we would get over our fears and our biases and our hatred, whatever it is, and we would just live it out. So I ask you this question with all the love in my heart that I have for you, and it's overwhelming, by the way. What do you smell like? What does your life smell like? Honest truth. I, some of you may be thinking, you know what, Brian? Okay, I'm gonna be honest. I'm not gonna say it out loud, but I love these people, but I hate these people. You showed one group. I love them. I hate them. Like, I, I literally hate them. I, I can't help it. I just hate them. And God's gonna have to just deal with me about it. That's a bad place to be. First John 4, 20. I want you to let this verse soak deeply into you. John says, if someone says, I love God, but hates a fellow believer, that person is a liar. For if we don't love people we can see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? Just stare at that verse for a moment. Because some of you right now, you, you need to get brutally honest with yourself and you need to ask yourself the question, am I actually, truly, really, certainly, without a doubt, a follower of Jesus. And I prayed a prayer when I was seven, Brian, but no, seriously, this is not, the, you don't want to roll the dice on this one. Okay, there, there's no gray area. There's no, eh, maybe, no, 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 no. You either are or you aren't. Aren't is not going to work. Aren't, I'm not, you, God is a God of love. He's a God of wrath. He cannot tolerate sin. Those who reject Jesus go to hell. That's the truth. Or do you need to give your life this morning to Jesus Christ? Receive the gospel message into your life to change you. Here's the thing. You can't, maybe for some of them, you can't love because you've never received the love of Christ in your life. Here's what you need to know. Darkness can't produce light. Death can't produce life. Hatred can't produce love. Only love can produce love. And God has loved you first. And now he is wanting to draw you in with his love. If you're, a, if you're a follower of Jesus, but, but maybe your life this morning has just been spewing out this fragrance of arrogance and pride and judgment and hatred and bitterness and anger, anger towards others. Here's what you need to do. You need to repent of your sin this morning. What does that mean? It means to change your mind in such a powerful way that it puts you and it sends you in a different direction. And how do I do that? Brian, you, you confess your sins before God and you receive God's forgiveness. Lord, I have hatred towards these people in my heart. Would you forgive me for that? I receive forgiveness. Let the, let the, ask God to break your heart this morning for the things that break his. I've been honest with you this morning about my feelings and how I've, over the years, ask God to break your heart this morning for the things that break his. And let me say this again. People who just drip with the fragrance of Christ, they're people who spend a lot of time in his presence. They let the word of God, it just soaks into their life. See, because the more time that you spend being intimate with Jesus, the more you will smell like his fragrance. And when his fragrance permeates a life, that aroma will just spill out of your life onto everything it comes into contact with. And it's a beautiful thing. When this church was just, like we started in 97, and I don't know when this happened, but this family came up to, we were at Vaughn Elementary School, and this family walked up to me after church, and they had a little three-year-old girl and a little, I think she was five or six at the time, and, I, and I'm looking at this little three-year-old. She was smart and sassy, but I, but I knew something was not quite right there. And it turned out, as the parents told me, that she had uh, just been discovered that she had a form of childhood cancer. And so... Um, they were sending her up to the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, Michigan to um, go to the, the hospital up there because they were treating it up there. And so she went up there and I got on a plane because my parents lived there and I, and, I, and I flew up there and I visited her in the hospital. Now, she could never call, she couldn't pronounce preacher, pastor. And so instead of calling me preacher, she would call me creature. And that went on for years, <laughs> okay? I, so I, all these years I've been in and out of her life and she was a waitress at one of my favorite restaurants and she'd go, hey, what you, want? What, what you want tonight, creature? You know, this was just this thing and she just had this spunk and funny sense of humor about her. But 
for all the, so many years her cancer would come and then it would go and she'd be in remission and she went to the same high school as my boys at North Paulding High School and she graduated with my nephew, Caleb. And, and uh, about a year and a half ago, December 2016, January 2017, she really, really pushed in to Jesus. Like she, I, 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 she got saved at Rush Camp and I baptized her when she was seventh grade. And, uh, but she really decided at that moment, and I remember talking to her about it. She said, I, I just decided it was time for me at the age of 21, I'm gonna push away from all my friends who aren't walking with Christ and I'm just gonna follow Christ with everything I have, even if it cost me everything. And, and it did. A lot of her friends walked away from her. And at the same time, she started getting sick and she had some issues where she couldn't swallow and she, it, there were some things going on where she couldn't eat and it was just a, and we sent Spencer Purdy up there. I mean, listen, this guy who sings over here, when he prays, things happen. And he went and prayed for her. And then a few days later, Amy and I went and spent some time with her and prayed and she, she, she was healed from this es esophagus thing. And then I found out Right after, um, right after Easter, that she had been in the hospital and her cancer had come back full steam. And we were gonna go up to see her and they basically brought her home and said, this is pretty much all the chemo she can handle. She's 22 years old. And I'm gonna tell you what, when I read that text from her mom, and then I called her. I mean, we, I was just crying with her on the phone because I've been following this little girl for 19, plus, uh, 19 years. And, and uh, man, it was tough. But I'm going to tell you something. When I was around her in the hospital or wherever, I mean, it was just like the love of Christ just coming off of her life was amazing. And her mom, Donna, and Lamar, they, her dad, Lamar, they were actually in the last service. And I asked for permission to tell this whole story. And so... I, I said to Donna, I said, Donna, we want to come over and see her again. And so we, we planned a day where we we're going to do that. And so we went over there and she said, now here's the deal. I'm going to surprise Ansley. Um, I want to get baptized. And I went, how are we going to do that? She goes, well, we'll figure it out. I just want to get baptized at my house. And I want her to see it because that's a concern of hers. And so Amy and I go over to her house and, and we're in her living room and they bring her downstairs. She can't walk. And, um, sit her down in a chair and she's just so, she's so spunky and she's just so, this smart sense of humor. And we were, we started talking about that, me visiting her in the hospital and I took her, she always talked about wanting to have a pony. And so I took her this like toy pony and I gave it to her and she looked at her parents like at three and she goes, this is nice, but come on now, you know? And so we started talking about that and about her cancer. And at some point she looked at her mom and she goes, what do I got to do to get a pony around here? You know? Um, and uh, we pulled out this metal basin and put it on the armor in front of where she was sitting and she said what's going on and Donna said um, Ansley I know this has been on your heart but, but I, I want to I wanna get baptized and she's like are you right in front of me and I'm like Brian came here to, to see you but to baptize me and so I said Donna share your testimony and so she started talking about just in the past year watching Ansley's life had just made such a drastic change in her life. That sweet aroma changed her mom's life. And so I baptized Donna right in front of her in this metal basin. You're like, well, wait a minute. It didn't happen up there. Get over it, okay? <laughs> it's not about how it happens. It's about understanding why it happens. And then I'll, Grandpa, he's 70-something years old from Tennessee, he looks at me and he goes, hey, uh, I, I'd like to do that. And I said, all right, would you, share, would you share with the room about your salvation story? And he goes, well, but I'll be honest with you. He said, um, this past year, I started going to this church. And, and uh, he said, I've been out of church for years. And he said, but I started going because of Ansley. And I've been looking at her and watching her life and going, I, I, I've got to have that. Whatever she has, I have to have it. And he said, so I started going to this church and I been talking with these, this man, and this one man actually talked to me about Christ in the parking lot. And so he said, I, I came to Christ right there in the parking lot. And he looked at Ansley and he said, Ansley, but it's because of you. It's because of your life. I know you lost a lot of friends, but you've just, 
I'm watching you live for Christ in the midst of all of this tough news. And I want that. And so I baptized grandpa right in front of her. And then she said, creature, I got something for you. And I said, what? And she said, I've, I've been, because I've had so much time, I've been painting and reading my Bible. And, and she said, I want to give you this. And so she, they brought out this thing and there's a picture. Me and Amy. And Ansley Cochran. And every morning when I get up, that's on the wall, right as soon as I walk into the, to the bathroom, it says, in the morning when I rise, give me Jesus. And she died on May 22nd. She went to heaven. And I did her funeral over here in the multipurpose. I've, I've done some tough funerals. My dad's, Andrew Praise. I mean, we, but that was right up there at the top. But listening to her life being shared by adults, and they didn't invite everybody. It was a private, it was a private funeral. I don't know how many were in there, but just listen to one person after the next talk about how her life had changed their life, especially in the last year and a half. I went, that's it. That's the sweet smell of the gospel coming off someone's life who has spent so much time with Jesus that it just permeates everything they touch, everyone they're around. That's how I want to live my life. I love you with everything I have as a pastor. I pray for you every day. But some of you need to repent this morning because there's hatred in your life. There's judgment inside of you. There's bitterness. There's bigotry. There's some racism. We can pray all we want. We can go into this prayer series all we want, but I want to tell you what God, as as I've marched around this church for the last almost two years, uh, God's revealed to me, until we as a community deal with racism, we will not see revival. time for some of you to repent. When I did this message at Rush Campus night for their kids on their face all over this, that auditorium, I don't need that. To, I mean, whatever God wants to do right now, that he, he calls the shots on response. But some of you need to come up and get on your knees and ask God for forgiveness. Some of you need to come to Christ because you're truly not saved. And if you were to die right now, you might be really shocked where you'd be. And you need to get that right. Some of you maybe have never heard this message before, but man, it's just pulling you in. Today's your day to receive forgiveness and new life, to be taken from death to life. Let's bow our heads. Right now, every one of you say, God, break my heart. Break my heart, soften my heart. Some of you have been away from church all summer. God, break my heart. Break my heart, break my heart for what breaks your heart. If it's sin, if it's whatever it is, break my heart and then you respond. If you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus to be your savior, pray with me. Say, Lord, at this moment, I put my faith and all my trust in Jesus. I can't do this anymore by myself. I need forgiveness of sin. I need hope. I need life. I'm asking that the love of Jesus would permeate my heart and I give my life to you. I ask you to be my savior. Would you forgive me? I repent of my sins and everything Jesus you did for me on the cross is enough. I receive your gift of salvation today. We're gonna talk more about that in just a moment. For some of you who need to just ask God for forgiveness and a fresh start or to deal with some deep rooted things that have been in your heart, in your life, when you see things pop up on the news, your heart goes to a bad place. Today's that day to say, God, would you forgive me? Look at me for a moment, if you would, for just a moment, because here's the truth. God left, and the Bible talks about this. Jesus said, that God loves you so much that he would leave, if there were 100 sheep, he would leave 99 just to go after you because he loves you that much. And don't think for a moment that he wouldn't go after that little Muslim boy over there, that he wouldn't go after that gay couple, that he wouldn't go after that young teenager, that he wouldn't, because he loves him just as much as he loves you every, every day bit as much he gave it put his son Jesus on the cross for every single person and everyone gets an opportunity to come to Jesus at some point hopefully 
but we got to tell them and we got to live it out. And because he came after you and you've said, yes, we, we ought to spend the rest of our life telling everyone about this, that we, this thing that we don't deserve. But God in his mercy and his grace, he said, you can't earn it, but I'll give you Jesus and I'll chase you down and I'll give you a chance. Don't say no anymore. And for those of you who are truly Christ followers, no more trampling on grace that we don't deserve. Let's live for him in every area. Let's smell like Jesus from here on out. Oh Lord, help us, help us, Lord, help us. Lead us in this song, Jason, you stand, you respond. If you need to come forward, get on your knees all over this place, whatever you need to do this morning, you respond to what God's putting on your heart. Don't you grab that chair in pride. You say, God, I've had enough. I'm gonna follow after you, come.